Hi, my name is Mark Evanstein, and I'd like to explain today a little bit about how to use classes to create your own tools uh, in Python using the SCAMP libraries for computer-assisted music. I'm assuming here that you will have watched some of the earlier tutorials that explain the basics of playing notes and using functions and all of that stuff. So to start with, we have a simple script here which just plays the opening of the Sibelius Violin Concerto. I've made a list of pitches here, a list of durations, this setup should look familiar from the other tutorial videos. I set the tempo at 120. And we just have a simple for loop that goes through a zipped version of the pitches and durations. And for each pitch and duration pair, plays a note with that pitch and duration. Let's take a listen to it. Great, so what we're going to do here is we're going to use list slicing to play different sections of this melody and actually to remix portions of the pitches with different portions of the rhythms. So for instance, we might play pitches 2 through 8. Now this is actually 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. When you slice a list, it doesn't include the last index. And then we might pair that with durations 5 through 11. So in both cases we've got 6, 6 pitches and 6 durations, but they're drawing from different parts of the list. And actually, I'm going to take this and I'm going to print it just to, for clarity here. And if we run it, you can see that the pitches it drew were pitches 2 through 8, and the rhythms that it drew we're starting here, number 5 through 11. So this is a fun and useful way to get some variety out of fixed material. You can imagine we could get all sorts of gestures by just taking particular segments of pitches and pairing them with other segments of the rhythm that weren't matched in the original melody. So the next step I'm going to take is to just have it pick a random set of pitches and a random set of durations both slices of the same length and we'll zip them together and play a random gesture derived from this Sibelius Violin Concerto Melody. So I'm going to start by importing the random library and down here I'll delete the print statement. And the first thing that we're going to need to do is determine how long our snippet is going to be. So I'm going to determine a snippet length to be randomly chosen from within the range of um, 3 to 9. So just like the range function in Python gives us the numbers 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, rand range picks one of those numbers randomly. Again, it doesn't include the top bound, so we're never going to get a snippet length of 9. Next, I'd like to figure out where we're starting within the pitch list and where we're starting within the durations list. So to do that, I'm going to say pitch start index equals, again, a random dot rand range. And I'm happy to start at zero, but we can't go all the way to the end because if our snippets of length four, for instance, we can't start right here, we'll run out of pitches. So where we're going to end is we're going to end at len pitches minus snippet length. This ensures that, for instance, if our snippet is length 4, we don't start anywhere past this spot within the pitches list. I'm going to copy and paste this line and do the same thing for the durations start index. We're rerunning the code so that the pitch start index might be different from the duration start index. And so now all I have to do is I have to have the pitches, the slice for the pitches, start at pitches start index, and then go from there forward by the length of the snippet. Same thing with durations. We're going to start at duration start index, and then go forward to duration start index plus snippet length. Now, if you're like me, this line is just way too long for your taste. So I'm going to take this 
and call this snippet pitches and take this and call this snippet durations and we'll put snippet pitches in here snippet durations in here and there we go we should have the makings for a random snippet player let's see how it works Sounds good. Let's see if we get another one that's interesting. Sounds good. And of course, if we want to, we could wrap this in a function. So we could say def play random snippet. Oops. And at the bottom say while true, play random snippet. Let's listen to that for a little bit. So you can see we're getting some kind of noodling, which you can hear is based on the Sibelius Violin Concerto, but gives us a little bit more variation. Clearly this form of variation is a useful compositional tool. And so what we'd like to do is make it as portable as possible so that we could easily apply it to different sets of pitches and durations, maybe have different copies of the process that we can use simultaneously. For instance, have, have one instrument be using the pitches and durations for, from one melody, another instrument be using the pitches and durations from another melody. That's kind of where we're going with this. And the most natural way to implement that is by using a class. So let's work our way up to creating a class by first considering how might we do this without a class. Suppose I wanted this Sibelius Violin Concerto snippet generator accompanied by a similar generator using the baseline from the Pink Floyd song Money. Well, the first thing I might do is create a part for that. So we'll say base equals s dot new part picked base, which I happen to know is part of the default sound font. And then the naive way to do this would be to simply wrap this in a function, call it Sibelius, indent everything, oops, and then copy it and paste it at the bottom and rename it money and then reach off screen into my magic repository of pitches and rhythms from all known music. Copy the baseline in question, paste it in here and all of this would stay the same. All I have to do is change this to be played by the bass. So if at the bottom I call Sibelius, we hear and if I call money, well actually first I have to make a small adjustment. A snippet length of eight is the entire length of the pitches list for this baseline. So I'll change it to range from three to six. And if I go ahead and play it, We hear, as expected, some snippet generation based on the money baseline. And if I want them to happen at the same time, I simply fork them. S.fork money. Maybe above it, I'll put S.fork Sibelius. And at the very end, if you remember from the forking video, we need to call something along the lines of wait for children to finish. Otherwise, the script will immediately end after forking the two parts. So if we listen. Then there we go. But it should be pretty clear that this isn't the best way of doing it. And you can often measure that by whether or not there's a bunch of repeated code. And here we've repeated huge swaths of code that effectively carry out the same function. 
So let's take this repeated code, in particular these lines here, and abstract them into a new function that plays a snippet. We'll call it play snippet. And we'll have it take a few arguments. Since in the one case we want it to be played with a violin, and in the other case by the bass, we'd better have the instrument be one of the arguments. Since the pitches and durations are different, we'll make those arguments as well. And then the last thing is the snippet length can vary. So then I'll go ahead and paste the code that we copied from below here. The names, pitches, durations, and snippet length already line up with the names of the variables we were using in the code. So all we need to do is replace base here with instrument. Finally, this function can sub in for the code here, where we tell it to play it with the violin, and here where we tell it to play it with the bass. Let's take another listen to it. So it still works exactly the same way, but now we don't have this annoying duplicate code. Instead, we have this function, which is a major step towards a reusable compositional tool. Functions are a great step in terms of creating reusable tools. But this situation really lends itself towards one further degree of abstraction, the creation of a class. The reason is that not only is there a consistent set of actions that's performed, which we've encapsulated in the function play snippet, but there's also a consistent data that it's operating on. And what we'd really like to do is bundle together the data and the action that acts upon that data. To illustrate why this might be convenient, let's see what happens if we try to write a script that alternates quickly between violin and bass snippets. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this all in a while true loop. I'm gonna delete the forks here. And I'll first play a violin snippet and then I'll play a bass snippet. Let's have them always be three long instead of a random length. And then I no longer need these two functions, but I do need the lists of pitches and durations. So I'll copy and paste those pitches and durations, these pitches and durations, and delete the function. So obviously there's a little naming issue here. They're both called pitches and durations. So we need to fix that by calling this violin pitches and violin durations, calling this bass pitches and bass durations. And then same thing below. The bass part has to be bass pitches and bass durations and the violin snippet has to be called with violin pitches and violin durations. And this works, let's take a listen to it. So it works, but there's a better way, namely to create a snippet player class, which contains both the lists of pitches and durations and the ability to play itself. We can see how such a class might work over here. Once we build our snippet player, we'll be able to create a copy of it by passing it the instrument it's going to play with, the list of pitches that it's going to play from, and the list of durations that it's going to play from. We can create another snippet player for the money baseline by passing it the bass and the pitches and durations from the money baseline. And now all we have to do is ask the Sibelius snippet player to play a snippet and the money snippet player to play a snippet, in both cases of length three. What we don't have to do anymore is specify that it's with the violin or with the bass or pass it the pitches or the durations that it needs to use. Those have now been bundled with the object. So how do you go about making a class or a type of object to use? So to start off with, to understand how classes work, let's start with a toy class called dog. All you have to do in Python is type class dog colon. If we want to leave it completely empty, we have to type pass. And now we've created a new type of object called a dog. And if I create a particular dog, let's say Rufus, and then I ask Python to print 
the type of that object, Python will say, that's a dog. Now, if we want to actually give the dog attributes, say a name and a number of legs, then we need to use this special magic method in Python called underscore underscore init underscore underscore. Now, when you're writing the init method, or really any method, which is a function attached to a class, it always starts by taking the argument self, which refers to the particular instance or copy of a dog in this case that we're talking about. I'll then have it take two main arguments, n and l, for the name and the number of legs that the dog has. And to make these attributes of the class dog, meaning data that gets attached to the dog that you're creating, we say self.name equals n and self.num legs equals l. So what we've done here is we've made it so that when you create a dog, it expects two arguments, which get assigned to the name and the number of legs respectively. Self is a special type of argument that you don't actually have to pass explicitly. We just use it within the definition of the class to refer to the particular dog that we're talking about. So now that we've done this, when we create the dog Rufus, we can say, oh, its name is Rufus, and it has four legs. Later now, if we ask Python to print Rufus's name, we can say Rufus.name and Rufus.numlegs, Python will print Oh, Rufus's name is Rufus and it has four legs. We can also create a second dog named Barkus, giving him 15 legs. And now the data is nice and organized. Uh, if we ask Python to print Barkus's name and Barkus's number of legs, we get Barkus 15. Now, so far, this is just a way of organizing data. But what's special about classes is we can perform actions using that data. So in this case, let's have the dogs have the ability to say hi. So def say hi. Again, it takes this first phantom argument self. And actually, let's make that it. We don't need any more information to say hi. We'll have the dog say hi by printing bark. My name is. And then we'll put in self.name here. And I have, and then we'll put in the string version of the number of legs, self.num legs. Legs. So now we can have the dogs introduce themselves by simply saying Rufus dot say hi and Barkus dot say hi. If we run it, it prints bark, my name is Rufus, and I have four legs, and bark, my name is Barkus, and I have 15 legs. So this is the basics of how classes work. And hopefully you can see where this is going at this point. Instead of a name and number of legs, our snippet player is going to have an instrument that it's playing with, a set of pitches, a set of durations. And instead of saying hi, what the snippet player does is play a snippet using that information. So now having learned everything we could from dogs, we're ready to actually implement the snippet player. Of course, we start by typing class snippet player. And we'll go ahead and create the init method to initialize the class. Def init. The first argument is always self. And then we're going to expect three arguments, the instrument, the pitches, and the durations. So we'll say inst pitches durs. And we'll use these to set the corresponding attributes. So self.instrument equals inst. Self.pitchList equals pitches. Self.durslist equals durs. So that's the initialization. And now if we look down here, we want to be able to call play snippet and specify the length of the snippet. So we'll say here, def play snippet. Again, put self first. 
And then we didn't see this with the dog example, but any arguments you want to send to a class method go right after the self. So in this case, we want play snippet to take the snippet length. The way this works is that when you call sib snippet player dot play snippet three, sib snippet player gets passed to self and three gets passed to snippet length. So now we can go ahead and copy in and adapt the function from before. So let's copy in the play snippet function that we came up with in the previous script. And now instead of pitches, we're going to refer to the pitch list stored within the snippet player object. So we're going to say self.pitchList. And instead of durations, we're going to say self.durslist. Again here, this pitches should be self.pitchList, and this duration should be self.durslist. And here at the bottom, the instrument should be self.instrument. Let's see if it works. Perfect. Now we've truly built a portable tool that we could use in all sorts of different pieces. And actually one thing that's often nice is to take this tool and put it in a separate file. I'll save this file to the same folder as the snippet player under just the name snippetplayer.py. And in this file, all we have to do is say from snippet player, it searches within the same directory. So it finds this snippet player file import the snippet player class. What's nice about this is it still works. Oh, or rather it would have worked if I remembered that the snippet player uses the random library. So we have to make sure to import random over here. And if we try running it, Works great, and the code looks super clean. Now clean code doesn't just look better, it's actually more powerful. So I wanna end with an example that would be really hard to code without actually encapsulating the snippet player in a class. Here I've created a somewhat larger and pretty eclectic ensemble. We've got the pitches and durations again from the Sibelius Violin Concerto. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a list of snippet players. So looping through the instruments within the session, so looping through violin, guitar, harmonica, piano, flute, clarinet, I'm gonna add a new snippet player to the list for each instrument using the pitches and durations of the violin concerto. And then at the bottom, I'll say while true, we're going to repeatedly pop the last snippet player from the list, insert it back in the front of the list. This way it cycles through the snippet players without repeating and then fork this next player's play snippet function. We'll pass to it as an argument, a random length of snippet, and then wait one and a half beats in between. So every one and a half beats, the snippet player for one of these instruments is gonna play a short segment of the concerto melody. Let's take a listen to that. So pretty interesting. And definitely by far the easiest way of doing this is by creating the snippet player class. But I'm also gonna add one more element to this, which is that the snippet player, I added a method to it called transpose. And if you call transpose, then it takes its pitch list and it shifts it up or down by however much you've asked it to transpose it. And so this changes the state of the snippet player. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to make it so that Every time we pop the next player off the stack, we say if random dot random is less than 0.1, so 10% of the time, because this is a number between zero and one, we'll say next player dot transpose negative five. So every time we pick a snippet player off the pile and ask it to play its snippet, there's a 10% chance that it shifts down a fourth. 
And once it shifts down a fourth, it will forever be down a fourth until it shifts down a fourth again. So the result is this is going to drift tonally. At the beginning, they'll all be in D minor, but gradually some of them will shift down to A minor, then E minor, then B minor. Notice that this would be particularly awkward to do without a class because it's the object that's storing the state of the pitches of the snippet player. So let's see what this sounds like. So hopefully this gives you some sense of how you can use classes to build your own compositional tools. And over time you can amass not just a snippet player, but a bunch of other tools that become elements of your musical language when you compose using Python and Scamp. Thanks for watching.